it was very detailed and had very precise measures. Um, another interesting thing is that the map contains more information than simply the bathymetry and coastal features that would be necessary for navigation. Um, Hassler's maps contain locations of houses and roads and forests and wetlands and even in one instance a hotel. And they were so detailed that even every individual tree in the forest was drawn separately with its own little shadow. Um, why a coastal survey map would be so terrestrially detailed is a mystery, but for our purposes it was very useful to understand what the landscape looked like in the early 1800s. Now to give you an idea of the level of detail, we're going to go to a close-up. This is an area of coastline in Brooklyn near Fort Hamilton. Um, just in this little area you can see the detailed features. You can see there's a uh, sandy beach right there and wetlands. Um, we have roads, and these are all separate buildings, and you can see all the different farm plots. Um, so this was this was very useful, and because of the high resolution, we were able to digitize very precisely around the borders <coughs> of each uh, feature, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so one thing that we're definitely cognizant of while using Hassler's maps is that these maps are from a time period 200 years after the time period that we were trying to look at, if in the early 1800s. Um, however, New York, especially the outer boroughs, is a great deal less urbanized and modernized then as it is now. So it's able to give us a better look at what the landscape would have looked like in the time period prior to that. And taking another little step back, this is a coastal survey map from 1837, also by Hassler. Um, it was in his first round of coastal surveys, and it was what he based his later maps off of. We ended up using a lot of coastal survey maps because they were what allowed ships to navigate the harbor. So especially for the shoreline, they had to be very accurate. And while the coastal surveys were great for finding the shoreline, uh, we wanted to focus on more maps that looked at property lines and areas that would be good for development to get a better sense of what was uh, in the inner landscape. So one of the cartographers that we looked at was Julian Bien. And he had this fantastic map from 1891 uh, this is showing the Brooklyn region as well as Jamaica Bay, and he had a similar one just north showing um, the Bronx, Queens, and Manhattan. Um, so this had a great deal of detail of wetlands, uh, forests, and most notably um, topography. And here is a region of the moraine. Um, we had a very hard time finding detailed topography of the moraine, but this was the one map that we we're able to find that had great detail. You can see um, the lines show 20 feet of elevation, and then there's points that show um, how high each area is. Um, we also looked at earlier maps, such as this one. This is a military manuscript from 1776 by Glasswoods. And while it had a great deal of detail within the inner landscape, we found that it wasn't as accurate as we had hoped and we're not able to utilize it as, uh, to the best of its ability. And so this is just a detailed look at what the Blaskowitz map looked like. Um, also showing individual trees with shadows, uh, wetlands, and creek system. And so while looking for these, um, these map sources, we are also looking at textual resources. Um, this is from a magazine that was published in the late 1800s and uh, by an article, in an article by E.S. Nadal, who was the park commissioner at the time. And I would just, I'll just read a quote that he wrote to give a better sense of what you might have seen um, on the ground in that time. Beavers were at once, at one time, very common on the Bronx River. The last of them was seen about 1790. It is said that they were, they at one time changed the course of the Bronx by a dam. Of course, beavers knew how to build dams long before men did. If the current was feeble, they saved themselves trouble by building the dam straight across. But if it was strong, they built the dam in a convex shape so as to resist the strength of the water. It is therefore possible to tell the force of the stream from the shape of the beaver's dam. And this is just a view of the Bronx River before development. And here is a chart showing the, a few of the maps that we selected and utilized for our process. Um, and the dates as well as the card papers. Okay, so once we had found our maps and georeferenced them with an adequate amount, the next step was to digitize the features that each map shows. So the map here shows wetlands, streaks and streams and creeks, 
uh, a shoreline, and the red numbers are topo topography points. Other maps show things like beaches and mud flats. So our first step was to take these map images and turn them into digital representations of the features that each one shows. To do so, we create what's called a shape file, which we could graphically overlay onto the maps. Um, at a predetermined scale, we plot a vertex for each point. We then carefully outline the entire area to create a polygon. Keep track of all of our shapes, we created a place name for each one. A place name tells us the location of the feature, the type of feature it is, and we give each feature a name. The place name then goes into our attribute table, which is shown on the left-hand side. So we made a lot of points. This is an example of the East Bronx shoreline. Um, each group had between four and six maps, each map showing different features of one another. Some, some maps were more focused on geographical areas, while other maps were more specific in the feature types. Um, so we created polygon files to encompass wetlands, beaches, and other types of things. And we created polylines to represent street, streams and creeks. Um, when we had digitized layer files for each different features and the different maps, we then had to somehow synthesize these into one final synthesis file. So this became tricky when we overlaid something like a shoreline on top of one another. In general, they, they were overlaid similarly, yet there were variations along the smaller scales. When we came to this point, oops. When we came to this point, we had to make our decisions based on the context of the map and how it overlaid with the modern maps. To determine something like the accuracy of a feature, say a stream, we took into account each of the maps that we used. For example, if three of the maps showed a stream very close to each other, while the fourth map showed the stream 200 meters away, we usually determined that the streams on the first three maps were more accurate than the one that was further away. Um, in general, coastal surveys were found to be the best for shorelines, and land use maps were better for things like streams, creeks, and um, topography. So once we made our decision on the shoreline, we came up with a map that looks like this. This is the East Bronx from the Bronx River on the left-hand side going eastward. And we did the same process for each of the feature types. Once we had created our final, oops, final shape files, we could um, use the different tools within GIS to calculate things like the area for the polygons and the length of the streams. We could then compare that to our current area to see how much streams were lost and how much um, land area was actually gained. The final step was to interpolate the topography. What this means is that using our topography points, contour lines, streams, shoreline, and beaches, we were able to use the tools in ArcGIS to fill in the gaps and create um, an image of the overall elevations of our entire area and create an image that looked like this. So now the groups will come up and show us their results. <coughs> and on that note, I would like to present to you guys the findings for the, for the East Queens group. Uh, so here you see a picture of what all of our different features laid over each other look like. Uh, you'll notice that you have uh, wetland, streams, a shoreline, and a lot of topography. Uh, and here is a table that shows our results. Uh, basically you can see that there is a, a lot of tidal wetlands. There's about 10% uh, of the total land area, and that there is also a smattering of streams and ponds throughout as well. Uh, so basically, here you can see the historical shoreline here in red laid over the modern day uh, aerial view of these creeks. And here you can see it with the tidal wet wetlands where they would have been historically, with the streams and the ponds, and all, with all of the uh, varying topography. And here you can see the DDM file that Kyle mentioned as well, uh, that would give uh, watersheds and also uh, runoff direction uh, oops, for the area. All right, so this is East Queens today. This is our historical shoreline. And here, in the green, you can see how the shoreline has been extended over time. And here is the percent change that we, uh, we've seen from about 1609 to the present in the You'll notice that the shoreline, the wetlands, and streams have decreased dramatically. But interestingly, we found that the total area of ponds has risen uh, due to the shoring up of the flushing meadow area. We also found uh, that the total upland area has been extended as well, uh, thanks to uh, the creation of LaGuardia Airport. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, don't worry. Um, so now we're going to look at a couple of specific uh, areas in East Queens that have changed dramatically. Uh, so here is Flushing Meadow, Corona Park. Um, all this area here was at one time wetlands, but now, like I said, it's a park. Um, for a while, uh, it was a landfill, and it was a depository for coal ash, animal manure, and regular landfill, until the 1939 World, uh, World Fair came to town, and at that point, 
uh, the area was diverted, well, the waste was diverted and it helped create the foundations for the Long Island Expressway, the Jackie Robinson Parkway, and the area got a complete makeover and is now the beautiful park that it is today. And then there's LaGuardia Airport in Flushing Bay. Now I know LaGuardia looks and feels like it's been around for over 400 years, but in reality it's actually not that old either. Uh, it was created in 1939 when the Flushing Airport, which was at one point located around here, uh, became obsolete. It also suffered from uh, a lot of flooding as well. Um, so landfill was diverted from Rikers Island, the landfill on Rikers Island, uh, to create this uh, land mass, as you could say, that is now LaGuardia Airport. Hello, um, so now I'm going to take it south of the moraine, um, which is actually right here, this line, um, and talk about Jamaica Bay. So after our group was finished digitizing all of the various natural features that we found on a variety of U.S. Coastal Survey maps, um, we were able to come up with this composite map of all these natural features um, that we had a lot of confidence in their, their actual place that being correct. Um, we then 